coming to you live from Colorado State University. Welcome to the Agnex podcast, where we talk about sustainable solutions for animal agriculture. Welcome to episode one. We're really excited. I'm JR, one of your hosts, and... I'm Pedro. And today we have a very, very special guest with us, Dr. Kim Stackhouse Lawson, director of Ag Next. Um, if you're not familiar with the beef industry, you may not know her, but if you are, then you definitely know Kim Stackhouse Lawson. She is a rock star when it comes to sustainability, I would say the best in the business, and we're excited to have her joining us today. Welcome, Kim. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and let Kim introduce herself because I'll probably do a poor job. So Kim, welcome to the podcast. Let us know a little bit about you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So my name's Kim and um, I grew up in the agricultural industry. Well, sort of grew up in the agricultural industry. Oh, so tell us more. I know my mom and dad are actually um, foresters. So more of a natural resource family. Um, my mom was actually the first female forester in California. I'm very oh, proud wow. of her achievements. Um, and so I grew up really um, in nature, in the mountains. Um, and when I was nine years old, my parents took me to the county fair for the very first time. And that was actually my first experience other than consuming animal agriculture products um, with animal agriculture. And I fell in love with um, a sheep and I told my parents that I wanted to do 4-H and they allowed me to. Um, and so I got my first ewe. Her name was Dolly. And that was before the cloned Dolly. Okay. So you're, um, claim, you're claiming yeah, Dolly is yeah, the first name. Yep. That's right. We had the first Dolly. Um, <laughs> and awesome. she was my very first ewe and my first 4-H project. And by the time I was in sixth grade, we had 60 use six zero um, and my 4-H project had exploded and at that point my parents moved from our five acres to a section of ground um, that they were actually able to buy after California's first mega um, forest fire and so we were able to purchase that land for four hundred dollars an acre so very very affordable mm -hmm. and my parents replanted it to trees oh cool and because it was too small to really afford any sort of herbicide application, um, we used my sheep in an agroforestry type mm -hmm. method to graze um, through the trees. And so I really grew up with this unique understanding that animals and the environment could really um, coexist and were dependent upon each other. Mm -hmm. And that inspired my career um, in sustainability. From there, I went um, to UC Davis where I had an undergraduate degree in animal science. Um, I had the good fortune there of living in the livestock unit. So I lived in the sheep barn and then I lived in the beef barn, which was free rent. It was great. Um, and that was my first experience with research because that's where okay. the research animals were housed. And so I was the undergraduate that fed research projects right um and it was it was amazing and then um i received my master's and my phd there okay studied under frank mitloner and mm -hmm. did some of the first greenhouse gas work in the animal agriculture space awesome um from there i went to the national cattlemen's beef association um like most graduates i actually had four jobs when i graduated so i worked for the national cattlemen's beef association um on behalf of the beef checkoff and started that sustainability research program and that was only a half-time job at the time awesome and then i was a postdoc at kansas state mm -hmm. university um and then my husband was going to graduate school so i had two jobs um mucking stalls at horse barns actually to to pay for, to pay for, um, yeah, hit, hit, yeah, I like to say. So his, it's interesting because you, you went, went from no real agriculture background to mucking stalls as, as yeah. a job. Right. It's really Absolutely. interesting. Absolutely. And then, um, from there transitioned full time to NCBA. And while I was there, we, we built the first sustainability um, research program on behalf mm -hmm. of the beef checkoff and started the U S round table for sustainable beef. Um, and the NJBS recruited me. And so awesome. I had the opportunity to go work for JBS USA and run their corporate sustainability program for the company um, outside of JBS. And I was there for five years and then um, joined the team at CSU. That's awesome. Yeah. Great. And you covered a lot in that first intro. That's amazing. Pedro, yeah. next question? You want to yeah, uh, ask some more questions? I, I'm trying to think here. And, and Kim, you mentioned like you were exposed to these integrated systems since growing up. And, and what is, what interests interests you about sustainability and animal agriculture that I mean make you exposed to that when you're young and keep working on that what what drives you to stay on this field and what is your passion about it uh, and to stay and, and try to make progress on that as yeah yeah so um that's evolved i think mm -hmm. over time um when i was a kid i would have told you it was all for the animals and the environment right and mm -hmm. and that i loved both of them so much um, and I wanted to help. Today, it's transpired more to feeding people. And I really, I found that at JBS. I found that um, a lot of 
you know, the work we do is noble. We, mm-hmm. we truly feed the world. And animal protein is, um, it's unique, right? It's not in every diet. And developing countries um, deal with a lot of nutritional issues um, for people. And so we are, um, certainly here in the U.S., we're, we're privileged to have access to, to animal protein and animal products. Um, and so all of that has very much combined. So um, my love for animals, my love for the environment, and my love for, for people into the work that that we get to do here at Agnex today. And I do love the complexity. Um, Animal agriculture is the most complex food system in the world. And then when you add elements of sustainability around it, the complexities are oftentimes overwhelming, right? They they feel um, so so big and so overwhelming that sometimes you don't know where to start. Um, But there's so much beauty in that system and um, it affects so many uh, people in a really positive way. So that's what that's what gets me out of bed. In the yeah, page. and and if you think about uh, when you're growing up, you think about one sustainability, a way of production like having the trees and the sheep together. Is there anything like if you could, for example, if someone asks you, "Hey Kim, what do you think about sustainability? What is sustainability to Kim? Do you have a good definition for that?" No, uh, I've never been asked it um, <laughs> to Kim, right? So I always get yeah. asked as a technical or a professional um, in sustainability, what is sustainability? And of course, we would define it with those three c- critical pillars of social, mm-hmm. environmental, and economic. And it's really important to always say that not one of those pillars overshadows the other. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's sustainability to Kim? That's a good question because everybody has a different definition. And I think that's one of the really beautiful things about sustainability is that those definitions, they're, they're all okay, right? Yeah. And they should all be encouraged and they mm-hmm. should all be welcomed. And um, that that's really that diversity of perspective is what's actually going to move the field forward. Um, so when I think about it, I, I go back to where I grew up, right? That section of ground that my parents really bought for me and my brother. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, our sheep flock grew from 60 to 300 while we were there. Um, the cows, we had 60 or 75 cows, and now it's just trees, right? Mm-hmm. Now, um, my mom has, I think, 10 ewes left because she loves them, and embarrassingly, I think they were all bottle lambs, right? So she's <laughs> she she has this real uh-huh. kind of... The emotional um, attachment yeah. to those animals. Mm-hmm. They're her pets. Um, so it's very much transitioned. Um, but when I go home, right, I... I want I want that um, that piece of land that landscape that my parents have done such an incredible job um, managing. I want it to be there in our mm-hmm. family, right? And my my brother lives in California with his wife. They live um, further away, but I hope that eventually they are able to to move mm-hmm. um, to to our home place. And I hope that you know they have kids and that they get to grow up there. And I hope my kids get to go visit it. And I never want it to go away, right? So I think yeah. that that's really um, you know that kind of knits our fabric, um, my fabric together, and and that's what that's what it means to me. That that's pretty cool. I mean, I I agree with you. I think we want to keep generations together and, and working in some things that we've we've worked before. And when you think about this, you mentioned a little bit about your previous, um, let's say, opportunity or previous experience in the industry. And is this thinking about sustainability that made you? think about coming back to academia what 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 made you come back to academia like you mentioned about your previous experience uh, in NCBA then JBS working sustainability why why Kim came back to to academia yeah that's and, a good question and maybe act next yeah um well it was certainly for ag next um i don't think i would have come back t- i know i would not have come back to academia for the traditional right you're a faculty member and you do one thing really well because that's not that's not who I am, and it's not what excites me. Um, so it's the only reason I would come back is is for um, a program like Agnex that really brings together a multidisciplinary perspective and really tries to solve the problem. There isn't a problem. We're not trying to solve a problem. Try, try, try mm-hmm. to wicked, develop wicked challenge. Yeah, right? yeah, wicked challenge. Yeah, we're really trying to develop to develop solutions to a wicked challenge, um, and those solutions are multifaceted, right? And so mm-hmm. we think we're developing a team and a program here where there isn't a right answer there's a better answer right and Mm -hmm. we have a team of people who truly believe in that systems approach um and so I loved 
um, my job at JPS. I loved what we got to do. I loved being in the supply chain. I love corporate sustainability. Um, it is wickedly complex. Um, you know, you report everything from animal welfare to team member health and safety to community investment to environmental impact, right? You, it mm -hmm. is, it is radical transparency, um, all to, um, hold your individual self accountable. And so that's, that speaks to, to who I am as a person. And I loved the work. Um, the challenge with that work was that there are um, expectations that companies are um, responsible for their supply chains. And mm -hmm. in the JBS system, beef is, of course, a, tr a tremendous protein. Um, and that, that would be true of, of any major food company, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but the lack of solutions that we had to address the wicked challenges um, in beef production predominantly, ruminants certainly. Um, you know, I had great partners at JBS. I had beef producers who would do whatever I asked them to do, um, especially if there was an incentive to do it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the company was willing to do that. But there was nothing for me to tell them to do. There mm -hmm. was no solution that I could say, go do this and then track it, track the reduction, actually, right, report, measure and verify mm -hmm. that, that that strategy was implemented and we saw an improvement. And so that, right, that sort of gap that was existing um, and then the create CSU being forward looking enough um, and having enough leadership to, to create Act Next, um, yeah, I'll never forget when the job description came out, I read it and thought, oh my goodness, I think this might have been written for me. And of mm -hmm. course it wasn't written with me in mind, mm -hmm. um, but I felt I felt like maybe I, I could make a difference, more of a difference um, back in academia, um, working for the land grant mission, working for a greater good, um, and really thinking about the development of solutions that would lift lift the industry. That's great. Awesome. Well, now that we've kind of introduced Ag Next into the conversation, I'm wondering, would you be able to tell us a little bit about the team? You know, who's on it, how you how you started it, yeah. how long you've been around, that kind of stuff, or how long we've been around, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have officially been in existence for two years now. I think under the name of Ag Next, mm -hmm. I have been um, with CSU for two and a half years. So when I started, um, it was just me. Um, we didn't have a name. We didn't have a website. Um, and so we went to work building um, what a truly multidisciplinary team would look like. And I think one of the unique things about Agnext is our connection to our industry stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And that was the intent of the program when CSU launched it. They saw a need for stronger industry academic partnership to address wicked challenges mm -hmm. that the supply chain could not address on their own. Um, and they wanted to hear those challenges from the supply chain, right? And, and not just, not just producers within the supply chain, like truly the stakeholders, um, across the, the livestock supply chain. Um, and so we went to work building that and, uh, had great leadership, um, from CSU and great commitment from two colleges. So Agnext is a provost initiative, and then it sits between the College of Ag Sciences and the College of Vet Med and Biomedical Sciences, which means there's fiscal support from the provost and then those two colleges. Mm -hmm. um, and the most exciting thing about Agnext is the commitment that CSU has made to actually bringing um, people, right? Attra not just a, not just hiring people, but truly a commitment to attracting the, the best talent mm -hmm. and supporting them to work on sustainable solutions. And these solutions are, are not easy. Mm -hmm. right? they're, you mentioned they're, it was really complicated they're, earlier. They're not easy. Um, and so special, there's a special kind of person that is willing mm -hmm. um, to commit their professional careers to this. Um, and so CSU has committed a 12-person tenured faculty cluster hire, and then they support that with uh, a impressive PR team because the intent is to not just have scientists that work in silos, but to have a multidisciplinary team that addresses these wicked challenges and also 
communicates that in, in mm-hmm. a way that is relevant to our stakeholders and relevant to the supply chain. Um, so we are done with six of those hires right now. We have two livestock economists that specialize in um, carbon markets, cost of implementation. Um, they, they do in absolutely incredible work with precision um, technology adoption. They think about producer adoption and, and what drives producer adoption. Mm-hmm. Um, we have two feed yard system specialists, uh, Dr. Pedro Carvalho, <laughs> who's here. And I then know that guy. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Sarah Place. Um, Yep. Um, both of them have different areas of expertise. Um, Sarah really specializes in greenhouse gas emissions from all production systems. Um, and then Pedro um, is an expert in ruminant nutrition with um, heavy emphasis in um, beef on dairy work and overall feed yard production. We have a dairy system specialist, Diego Manriquez, who's a stress physiologist who specializes in big data um, and precision technology. So really thinking about sustainability through the lens of improved animal health and also um, does a lot of, of work with um, team members on dairy. So how can we more, better empower um, those people who are working um, in animal agriculture to make better decisions in real time um, and to help really lift um, those communities in, into into a space of um, better decision-making on, on farms and ranches and dairies. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have two modelers. Um, Dr. Greg Toma um, joined our team who is um, just absolutely th- i mean he is the best in the world um at life cycle assessment um work he's done most of the carbon footprint work um that has been done in animal agriculture and then dr john sheehan who is phenomenal systems modeler um so so two different types of modeling mm-hmm. um that rounds out that first hire of the team um and then um, oh and can we mention the names of the economists oh yes I think sorry we, i think we transitioned yeah. and then yeah. we started doing it. i just want to make sure they Doc- get airtime too absolutely <laughs> dr john written and dr nate delay awesome yep. thank you yep <laughs> Absolutely. And then um, we will move forward, it sounds like, um, with three to four additional hires this year. To Plus the a pretty good communication team yes, as well, right? Yes, a very good communications team. <laughs> yeah. So yes, yeah, so you can't see you can't see our producer, Erica Giesenhagen, but she's over here doing a great job. Just want to give her a shout out, too. Yeah, <laughs> Erica and JR, they yep. do a phenomenal job. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. So so you've, you've done a great job um, describing the team. So I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about how, like, how it's been for you mentoring such a robust, talented team of scientists. Yeah, um, I don't think I mentor oh, <laughs> this, okay. this group. Yeah, um, and I only say that because um, there's one of the really special things I think we've been able to create here um, is so much mutual respect between the scientists. Um, when our team comes into a room together, they like each other. Um, they respect each other's perspectives. Um, they expect, um, but they respect the, the dialogue, right? Because we don't agree on mm-hmm. everything. You're never going to agree on everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and they really come together to work as a team to achieve whatever the objective is, right? And we don't, um, it's really interesting, you know, there's certain team members that, that may have a few research projects that are happening outside of our cluster, but I would say that the majority of our team, all of the work happens within um, the parameters of Agnext, within the mission and vision mm-hmm. of Agnext. And that was the intent of CSU, right? And when we were hiring these people for the first time, um, there was a, some good questions that came from faculty that said, you know, how, how, do, I, how do we make sure this is not um, too hundred percent appointments so that I have two jobs, right? Because every faculty is shared Mm -hmm. by Agnext and then shared by a partnering department. Mm -hmm. So the economists, for example, work in the department of ag and resources economics. Mm -hmm. Um, Diego, Pedro, and Sarah are in the department of animal science, Mm -hmm. um, as is John Sheehan. Greg Toma is actually in the extension. He's a, Mm -hmm. he's with the ag experiment stations. Um, Mm -hmm. and so they have, um, uh, there's different expectations that come from those departments for, for our faculty members. Um, and so one of the questions from faculty when, when we were hiring them is, how, how do I not have two full-time jobs? Like, how do we make sure mm-hmm. um, that, uh, that I can actually achieve what's being expected of me? And we responded with, it shouldn't feel like you have two jobs, right? You're, you're this engaged kind of work mm-hmm. Um, should feel like you just have extra support 
Mm-hmm. Um, and like a, more of an integration. Right. Mm-hmm. And more collaborators. Okay. Like it should just be more collaborators. And I, th- I think we've done a good job creating that so far. Right. So I think when, when we win research projects, right, we've got a grazing project. I'm only going to use this for an example because mm-hmm. Pedro is here and clearly has expertise in feedlot systems. But when we start a grazing project, right, pa- Pedro's involved mm-hmm. in that ideation. Pedro's involved in the execution. Mm-hmm. Pedro's involved in making sure that his expertise is heard, even in even in a you know system, a grazing system where he may not have done research um, mm-hmm. before, and having a team with, and so are the economists, having a team with diverse perspectives ensures that we're actually doing a better job measuring all of the potential trade offs of whatever it is we're testing, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a particular trial where we're looking at um, an intervention that would reduce methane emissions from grazing systems. Mm -hmm. But we need a very robust team to come around that trial to make sure that we are measuring everything we need to to make sure that there's not an unattended consequence Mm -hmm. from a methane mitigation, right? That would make that solution not actually scalable. Mm -hmm. And same is true for our PR and communications professionals. If we are ideating a research project where we think there may be consumer pushback or there may Mm -hmm. be stakeholder pushback around the Mm -hmm. technology that we might be testing, we want to know that, right? We want to hear that so that we are doing this research, eyes wide open, radical transparency, and talking about those trade-offs. Because these systems are complex Mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that we move them forward in all aspects of sustainability, not just focused on one. Mm -hmm. Balancing those three pillars, like you mentioned earlier. Absolutely. So, so in our conversation now, um, you just mentioned, um, you alluded to, or just mentioned um, vision and mission and also scalability. So I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about how and why scalability and producer profitability are so central to our mission here at AgNext. Yeah. So when, CSU asked for our team to develop a program that was truly integrated with our stakeholders, right? That, that, that's a different way of approaching an academic program, right? Typically, um, academic programs extend knowledge. And what we were asked to do was engage. And that mm-hmm. notion of engagement is two ways. Mm-hmm. And it starts with us listening, first and then sharing and then listening and then sharing um and so we to to execute that um we set up our industry innovation working group which is a group of 12 individuals who really take the leadership role in that engagement certainly we work with more individuals than just those 12 Um, but what we heard from that group of people early on is that they needed help they needed help taking the technology. There was not a research group today that was taking the technology from more of a test bed type approach, right? Where mm-hmm. where you might be testing something on very few number of animals and getting it to the point that they were comfortable doing research on it at, at a production scale. Um, and so that scalability, that's what we heard, is that there was this huge white space between very technical research and getting it to where we could actually do research commercially. Um, And so that's one thing that they asked us to tackle, right? And Mm -hmm. um, like I said, that takes a unique team. That's a unique person that wants to interface in that in that work, in that level of innovation, because sometimes that's the hardest. And sometimes that's where you find um, the answers to a question that could derail Um, a potential solution, right? It could Mm -hmm. take a solution completely off of the table. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have to have a very resilient Mm -hmm. team to do that because sometimes, you know, we get answers that are upsetting um, to to everyone, right? Where we're not making everybody, anybody happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing we heard from that group is um, this notion that economic sustainability, that we're just going to maintain our economic status that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing that. I think if you look Mm -hmm. around um, the food system today, um, farmers and ranchers are struggling, Mm -hmm. right? And that generational- Fertilizer, fuel costs going up. There's been a major increase in just general production costs. Absolutely, absolutely. And when we think about 
what drives me, for example, that generational trans, um, yeah. transfer of um, ranches and farms and dairies, they have to be profitable to truly execute that transition, right? Mm -hmm. Banks are involved, kids are involved, um, you know, when, when regulation is involved and, mm -hmm. and we need them to be profitable and we need um, their kids or new people to agriculture to have the opportunity to take over those operations and to be financially secure. Um, and so those are two very different things about Agnex from any other um, sustainability group in, in, the, in the world, perhaps, is our focus on true scalability and then that we truly embrace not just economic sustainability, but producer profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's pretty good, Kim. Just one, one last question before we move on to our next set and of our questions. Our next section of the uh, podcast. <laughs> so you mentioned about this industry innovation group and they were really important while developing everything. Can you just tell us like who is involved on that yeah. and how Agnex and this group, they interact? That just so we people who are listening to us have a better understanding how important this group is to us and to Agnex and, but who who is in the group and how much we interact with them? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the group has 12 individuals and each of them are on a three-year term and we staggered their starts, right? So um, when we started, we didn't want all 12 to rotate off at, at one time. So the mm -hmm. first four have rotated off. The second four will actually rotate off in June and we will then have added eight new. Um, and so the real intent here is for them to guide um, our engagement. Right. And, mm -hmm. and because we're a group that truly believes in that we listen and then we teach or we extend or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, the mm -hmm. mechanism is. And then we listen and then we extend and then we listen and then we extend in that way. They very much guide our research. Mm -hmm. Right. And they guide our faculty teaching. Um, and it gives us this wonderful group of people who continues to expand right that's the that's the wonderful thing about having people rotate off mm -hmm. and getting new people is mm -hmm. that the group is really not just 12 it's yeah. really 16 and then it's really 20 and then it's really 24 right mm -hmm. and our network continues to increase mm -hmm. and their willingness to call our faculty or te text our faculty right yeah. about the issue mm -hmm. of the day um increases and then our ability to truly influence and to hear from them increases. Early on, Pedro, they helped us with the vision and mission. They helped us yep. name the organization. They picked the logo, right? We we mm -hmm. wanted their input. We wanted their ownership. We wanted them to to feel like Agnex was as much ours as it as it was theirs. Kind of um, like a co-creation model. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. And then they also. Um, sit on our search committees. Um, and that's yeah. been that's interesting. one of the best things I think um, CSU has allowed. That was a new model. Um, and we had to get uh, all the way up to the very top of HR approval to, uh, to actually welcome a stakeholder um, in that way into the search process. Um, but what I think it's done for our new faculty is it's given them immediate um, camaraderie or colleagues yeah. with external partners mm -hmm. and um that's unique and it's special and um also there are also people involved in different sectors right yes. dairy beef banks banks mm -hmm. retail retail um, we're going to add an ngo this year which we're very oh, yeah, excited that's really about. exciting yeah yeah so yeah. that's pretty pretty good group and then can you just talk a little bit too about how you engage with state organizations in addition to sure. or commodity representation, that kind of sure. how those folks fold into that industry innovation group too? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, our in our um, vision statement, the the first um, stakeholders that we serve are the are the um, stakeholders of Colorado, mm -hmm. um, and so as we initiated that industry innovation group. Um, we really wanted to make sure that our livestock producer associations and farmer producer associations were at the table. And so um, the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, um, Farm Bureau, Colorado Cattlemen, and Colorado Livestock Association all have an open... Um, kind of like an honorary seat, yes, if you will. I mean, seat. Not part of the 12. They don't vote. 
Um, but they're always invited. They help to influence to every meeting. Yeah. Yep. To every meeting. Um, so is the Colorado um, Beef um, Beef Board. So the mm-hmm. the Beef Checkoff for Colorado is also invited. Um, and then we also um, invite Dairy Max. Mm-hmm. So the Beef Checkoff, mm-hmm. or I'm sorry, the Dairy Checkoff for this region mm-hmm. um, always has a seat um, or is always invited. And then mm-hmm. we have also extended invitations to the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And mm-hmm. we just we just want to make sure. Um, and we don't, no one is expecting to fully influence Agnext, mm-hmm. and we're not expected expecting to fully influence them. But having those open lines of communication mm-hmm. have been um, really important to our success. Mm-hmm. And they have also helped us to extend um, information and educational learning opportunities to state representatives, mm-hmm. um, to the Environmental Protection Agency, mm-hmm. um, and to to even to even more right um so it's it's been a really um special opportunity to to be a convener um of diverse thought and and diverse perspective and differently than academia does right i think academia Mm -hmm. is really good at convening um people around tough and complex discussions but actually convening them around solutions is Mm -hmm. new because mm-hmm. they have to be involved in the solution creation, right? Mm-hmm. We we can't we can't just develop a solution and then push it on mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. to on to our stakeholders, um, and so that co creation um, of solutions is is really it's it's been very six it's been a very successful model for us, and um, it's one we're very proud of. That's awesome. Hey. So I think you know our next section here is just talking a little bit about kind of your career, your personal life. Um, yeah, just and so um, curious. So you and members of the Agnex team are on the road a lot. You do a lot of interviews, a lot of radio shows. I'm curious if there's um, a question that you've never been asked that you maybe wish you would have been asked, or something that you're like, I've never had the chance to talk about this. Um, just yeah, curious. Yeah, well, it just happened with Pedro. Oh with goodness, the, how you de- you define sustainability? Well, we're doing great so yeah. far on the podcast. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know that there's ever a question. I I love being asked questions. Um, And when I give a talk, um, it's my favorite part because oftentimes I learn from the question that's being asked, right? And I Mm -hmm. think that we do spend a lot of time on the road and um, it takes a lot of time away from both our our work professionally and also, of course, our families. Mm -hmm. Um, But every time I go, I get to learn. And it's oftentimes how I'm able to keep a pulse on what's truly happening, um, because even though we've set up this wonderful engagement model, we are we're not in the supply chain. We're, we're mm-hmm. not in it every day, so we are siloed away from um, actual, you know, development of food food product mm-hmm. in, in in real time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I won't say that there's never a question I've been not been asked that I could think of today, but um, I always want the tough question. And I always want somebody to say, maybe even to ask a question that doesn't have an answer, or it might not even be a question, right? It's a mm-hmm. it's a thought, or it's a pressure that they're feeling, or it's mm-hmm. a it's a challenge, right? It's a it's some sort of wicked complex thing that they're that they're dealing with, or finding finding me afterwards and talking to me about it, because that's what will oftentimes spark the next idea or spark the next um, thing that we might be working on. So, mm-hmm. for example, we had a call yesterday with um, a wonderful retailer. Um, I won't mention who it is just because they might want to remain anonymous, but everybody knows them. Um, they're a great partner. And they actually asked us about our interest in doing pollinator work. And my immediate response was, I mean, we're a methane team, right? Because that's what we've been directed to work on mm-hmm. predominantly right mm-hmm. now is enteric yeah. methane. And our mm-hmm. team is, you know, they're putting their shoulder into enteric methane from every aspect that we can. How do we think about greenhouse gases? How do we reduce the climate impact of a beef production. And then this retailer said, you know, pollinators are really important to us and they're really important to our honey business. C- is there an opportunity to merge the two together and mm-hmm. to, to actually work on two topics um, through this way? And I don't know anything about pollinators other than I like honey and I know bees are <laughs> and important. And you like flowers. <laughs> right. 
and I like to eat and I know none of of us eat without pollinators. Right. But that is literally the limits of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I walked into our team. Um, we have a number of range ecologists um, who we didn't mention before, um, EJ Rayner and Anna Shabolt. And I said to them, do you know anything about pollinators? What about the bees? Right. Right. (laughs) And within not 45 minutes, I think we have three ideas. Oh, that's amazing. To integrate pollinators into our existing research and go back to this retailer and say, I think we actually could do this. Mm -hmm. This could be an interesting opportunity for a a cross discipline kind of project. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I guess my point is there's never a bad question, right? Mm -hmm. And it could spark the next research idea or the next opportunity for collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that's what this would be. This would be an opportunity to collaborate one of the largest retailers in the world and to make a difference um, in their food system and that, and that food production and to maybe improve honey and beef at the same yeah. time. I mean, All that's right. cool. Yeah. Win-win, right? Win-win. <laughs> Bee and beef together. Right? That's right. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so, Kim, thinking about these uh, new ideas and, and questions that you were never asked or things like that, what is something that you, that you know today that you wish you knew 10 years ago? Or maybe when you're starting your career. I'm not not saying that you've been in the field for 10 years. I've been in the field longer than 10 years. (laughs) But, yeah, there's something something that you would like to go back and tell the younger Kim, say, hey, if you learn this a little earlier, it's going to help you further in your career. Yeah. Um, That's always such a tough question. That is a tough one. I got very good advice um, when I started my postdoc at Kansas State from Dan Thompson. And um, I repeat this to myself today, weekly. When I was younger, it was daily. And it was, no matter how hard you work, you're never going to make up for experience. And that is... Yeah, you you know, you mentioned this the other day when we were working working cattle, and I had a friend helping us. Mm -hmm. And I met him after that. He said, oh, Kim said this. It's pretty good. I like like you. I think you mentioned this yeah. that day, and when we were talking later, he mentioned the same the same phrase again. So it's yeah. it's pretty cool. And it's an interesting one, right? Because that's what I wish I could change is to. I'm so driven, and I work so fast. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to get so much done, and I want to get mm-hmm. so much more done. But I have a hard time slowing down. <laughs> and and <laughs> celebrating successes and I have a hard yeah. time like taking a moment even for me and my family right and to mm-hmm. say um you know we're doing what we are building here is really really cool um and so you have to be careful with that phrase right because you yeah. wouldn't want to share it with an underperformer right because hard work yeah is how you achieve the experience absolutely mm-hmm. exactly. it's, it's absolutely. a part of it yeah, yeah, it's definitely. a part of it um but I still remind myself of that weekly like when I feel that self-doubt or the oh I didn't I didn't think about that I you know I missed it I missed it as a leader or I missed it as a scientist or I missed it as whatever um and then there's Dan you know hard <laughs> hard work will never um make up for experience and I think it's also okay to go ask for help from those who are more experienced than you yeah. and experience does not just mean older right or younger mm-hmm. or whatever I mean mm-hmm. experience is true experience um and I mean, we have we have students on this team that have more experience than I do in certain aspects. And mm-hmm, I think absolutely. our ability to lift those experiences up, put them in leadership roles and know when you need to be the one that's leading. But then also know when you need to be the one that is following direction is mm-hmm. is hopefully something we're mentoring our students um, around. Because, again, I think our team has um, great respect for each other. And you see that a lot of times you'll see people kind of yeah. jump in and take that leadership role. Yeah, it's so so interesting because we have a set of questions that we want to ask you. And I can tell you, Kim, I think she didn't read the question, but it's it's lining up exactly for the next question that we are thinking here is uh, talking about mentorship, right? You just mentioned about one of your mentors. We are talking about mentorship. And I assume even if you go back to, to your mom, which you mentioned that was the first forestry person in, in, in California, how, how do you... S- or how if, if we have students listening to us, how do you seek for mentorship or how do you advise new people, new professionals like me getting this field or 
seek for for mentorship and how important is that in your career i think you just mentioned that a little bit ago but how do you seek for that yeah um so my mentorship philosophy and i can't say that i actually have ever sat down and thought about the philosophy of mm -hmm. my mentorship but um the way i was mentored um my mentors cleared the path mm -hmm. and i stepped into the path and that ownership and accountability was all on me and they guided me in some cases and in some cases not right but oftentimes when I needed it they would guide me so I was always mentored by people that were exceptionally um, talented and um, leaders right leaders in their in their discipline um, had huge impact in their space um, and they were always kind enough to leave the door open Mm -hmm. after they went through for me. And so I think because I've always been mentored by people who ran at the same speed as me, they were always very, very fast mm -hmm. moving. Um, and oftentimes also did not celebrate successes. Well, mm -hmm. um, when you look at, at my um, resume or my CV, um, but they pulled me up behind them and they did so um, very authentically. Like they wanted me to be successful and they reached down there and they grabbed me and they pulled me right behind them. And um, I figured it out because I had opportunity, right? And I had good examples and they led by example and I followed the example. Um, and so that's how I've mentored um, so far. And it's easier with professionals, right? It's easier mm -hmm. for people who have the, um, who have done the hard work to develop themselves as experts, right? It's easy to clear the path for faculty and then empower them with whatever they need. Mm -hmm. And that's my role as the director at Agnext is to say, what do you, what do you want to do? What are you passionate about? What are you hearing from stakeholders? How can I help make this happen? Mm -hmm. And then to go clear that path and to let faculty flourish because they will, right? They will. Um, um, and our professionals, not just our faculty members, but our staff members, our P PR and comms people, our research staff. I mean, they're the best in the business, and it's easy yeah. to be the director of Agnext. Um, students are more difficult, Pedro, um, because they are they don't have that technical knowledge, and this may very well be the first hard thing they have ever done, mm -hmm. right, is graduate school. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember being like that. Oh, yeah. um, my master's and my PhD, my PhD certainly was the hardest thing that I ever did. Um, and the second good piece of advice that I um, received from a dear colleague, um, Shailene McNeil, she runs the nutrition program at NCBA. And I was talking to her um, about wanting to have a baby. And she has two kids. So this is when I was at NCBA and my husband and I had been married three or four years and we're thinking about um, having kids for the first time. And I was terrified like any normal <laughs> I think human that's a normal should be. Response. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked Shailene, I was like, how do you have mm. such an impressive job and, t and two kids? And she said, Kim, you survived your PhD, right? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah. She's like, listen, having one kid isn't half as hard as your PhD. And having two is not even close, really. It's like 90% of his hard. <laughs> okay. You'll be fine. Um, and it was, it, hearing that, right, was empowering. Yeah. But I, I'm i not sure until you're done with those degrees. Yeah. Do you really acknowledge how important that learning how to, to do that, learning how to work that hard and learning how to expect that much from yourself. Um, how many doors that opens for you until you're, until you're done. Yeah. I, I, it's pretty good because I'm coming back to the hard work does not make up experience, mm -hmm. but you have to put the hard work up front to be able to, so you, you had the hard work throughout your PhD. Then let's say you gain experience of hard working. And then once the, the new challenge faces, It's different. It's different because you already put the hard work back That's there right. and you gained that experience. And I think you also just get used to it. Yeah. Right? Experience is hard work too. Um, but this this tranche, these students that come through, and they're phenomenal and very, very talented. Um, but it's harder mentorship for all of us, I think. Getting them comfortable with hard work, right? That's yeah. a life skill. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and we never lose it. We always have that hard work. And experience always means hard work. It just... The hard work feels less hard, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's great. 
Well, and speaking of, you know, hard work, I know that you're, or I know the team here at Agnex has been grinding on research and, um, you know, discovery and trying to figure out all these really viable solutions for these really wicked challenges. And so I know that um, our team has been working to organize uh, the Agnex Research Summit coming up on June 14th. Um, curious if you want to tell folks like what they can expect at that event okay. and where they can get more information. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I'm going to put a <clears throat> quick plug in for our team. I think this summer I counted, we have nine live animal experiments happening. It's amazing. I think we have four or five um, modeling experiments and projects happening. And then we have 15 engagement outreach meetings, yeah, tours. I think, I think we just scheduled <laughs> a 15th know. tour for the How summer. Many yeah, we have, but um, it is two or three a week mm -hmm. um, for our PR and communications teams mm -hmm. to, to execute. Um, so the big, the big one is of course the research summit um, and then the ribbon cutting of our facility, which mm -hmm. um, is absolutely impressive the day before. So the research summit will be the 14th and this is an opportunity for people to come and see what we've been up to the last two years since That's we awesome. have been in existence. The last one we hosted, I believe JR and I were the only two official employees Full -time of Ag Agnext. dedicated yes. faculty, or not faculty, staff, faculty yes. staff, yeah. Um, on December 1st of 2021. So um, we've been busy and this is an opportunity for people to come here what we've been up to um, and to get updates on these wicked challenges, right? So we've made some progress um, getting some solutions and are improving our understanding of the most wicked challenges that our stakeholders have um, asked us to work on. So we'll be um, reporting results. We'll be talking about ongoing and current research. We'll be at listening to them. Um, what, what, what do they want us to work on next? Um, and so we'd love for um, people to, to come and attend our summit. That's awesome. If folks want more information about the summit, just go to agnext.colostate.edu and look for the research summit tab. We've got information there on how to register. Um, you can find more information on the agenda. That should be released hopefully um, next week. We'll have a little bit more detail there, but hopefully folks can join us for those two really exciting events. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Hope hope to see everyone with us in here. But Kim, we've talked about a lot about career and and it's been really fun and yeah, very impressive how many things you've done. And so we want to wrap up with some, let's say, not as formal questions. And and also we this is the fun stuff. <laughs> not that the other stuff wasn't fun. But yeah, but is, like you something know. you you've mentioned hard work a lot during this conversation, but. What else do you do? What does Kim do like to have fun? What, 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 do you have a free time or something that you like to do? Like you're not working your garden and thinking about work? Like what else, what do you do for fun? Yeah, I'm one of those that thinks about work all the time. Um, mm -hmm. I've given up on the whole, you know, hard line between personal and professional. Everything just kind of is messy <laughs> it's and like a work together. life rhythm yes. more than a balance. Yes, it's, exactly. Yeah. There's no balance in my in my life. It's just my work in my life and it's messed up in one giant amazing ball of yes, goodness ball of things. <laughs> yeah. um so um my most significant priorities outside of work are my two sons um weston and callan and weston is six and callan is three so wes will be graduating from kindergarten in a few days oh my goodness. um yes he's That's a big milestone he's very <laughs> big um and they are wild and into everything um wes plays um t-ball and soccer and basketball and Cal is a handful, <laughs> <laughs> to, put it, to put it kindly. Um, my husband and I um, have 30 acres and all, and he um, team ropes, so we he has horses um, and does that, and the, the boys are getting in um, to horses as well. And then I ride also. I have a little um, ranch horse um, who will give a call out to, to her um, home ranch because it's very impressive, but she's a little spade ranch filly, so she mm -hmm. comes from um, one of the historic Texas ranches that um, not doesn't just raise great horses but also raises cattle as well and then um, my true passion is um, dressage horses and so I have um, a beautiful um, Belgian warm blood and his um, name is Sir Diamant he goes by Dante and uh, <laughs> he goes by Dante in, in the bard uh, that's great yeah. Um, but yeah he's yeah he is very very special to me and um, that's what I that's what I do after the boys go to bed um, if I'm not if I'm not working I'm usually on my horse from about 
8 to about 9.30 at night. Um, and so my husband's wonderful. He supports me um, in that. So that's kind of what we do. And then on the weekends, we take care of our 30 acres and our kids and try to go home and see my parents some and see his parents as well mm -hmm. um, as much as we can. Very cool. Um, so, Kim, can you tell us about um, a really good book that you've read recently? Oh, my gosh. Does Dr. Seuss count? Really good book. Your definition. <laughs> <laughs> so I think yes. Um, yeah, mostly I just read to my kids. Um, we actually, um, the, the, actually, the book we read last night, and I'll just be a mom here because mm -hmm. I don't actually get to read other than scientific papers or kids' books. That's <laughs> mostly what I have time for. Yeah, um, so my mother um, is a great-grandma, and she, Nama, she goes by Nama. Nama. Um, she's a great mm -hmm. Nama, and um, she sends the boys a zoo box every month. Oh, cool. And, yeah, so it has a different animal, and um, the boys get, to, so it comes with, you know, all about that animal and a stuffy and then all of these scientific games and oh, all cool. of these very cute okay, things. Okay, so it's like very science -based. Yes, yes, very, of course. Yes, yeah. of course. Um, and so yesterday the zoo box came and it was brown bears. Oh, and cool. I, br bears are fascinating, right? I mean, they're really <laughs> fascinating creatures. And so there was a National Geographic kids book um, in there all about um, brown bears. Did you know there are eight species of bears no. in the world? No, oh, I didn't. So Incredible. we are all learning yeah. about beef, bees, and bears. That's wow. right. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah. So the That's other great. moms out there, National Geographic uh, bear book was pretty impressive, actually. <laughs> that was last night's awesome. reading. I love it. That's perfect. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and you've mentioned you've traveled, you travel a lot, and you've visited a lot of places in the U.S. and maybe around the world. What is the nicest place that you've ever been? Like your favorite place oh. to visit also? Two, um, so my parents, when we were kids, our vacation was to horse pack in the Trinity Alps, and there's no more special place to me than the Trinity Alps Wilderness um, in Trinity County of Northern California. Um, so I'll say that first, and then I will say my second place, favorite place is um, Melbourne, Australia. Mm. I absolutely love Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was with JBS, I, I did get to travel globally. Um, and I just, yeah, Melbourne is incredible. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, perfect. Well, Kim, thanks so much for hanging out with us this morning. Can, and can I ask oh, a last question? Yeah, we can. We can ask a last One question. One last question. And yes. I'm going to put you on the spot now. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> how is working with Kim? Oh, man, working with can Kim. You, and how can you define yeah. how is working with Kim? That's really Erica, please cut this. If, 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 if. <laughs> but this, no, I, I just thought about this now. Yeah. You've been working for her for the longest among um, all of us. How yeah. is that and experience? Yeah, we share an office. Yeah, so I do. Yeah, so Kim and I, um, we do share an office. So I'm the head of strategy and communication. So I work really closely with Kim. Um, and she's not joking when she talks about the pace and the drive and accomplishing a lot in a short amount of time. Um, and so I think that's been really um, interesting to work in academia at a more corporate pace. And so that's challenged me professionally to be able to um, meet our stakeholder expectations and Kim's expectation and helping to um, empower the team to meet her vision of what Ag Next is and will be. And um, it's been very rewarding for me professionally. That's great. That's what I, I it's my short experience has been something similar, but you've been yeah. working with her. For a long Two years I, now, good basically. Job. Oh, and, thanks. And, and <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Oh, no, there, I was definitely surprised I was getting a question. That's Yeah, that's something that I think it's 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 what I think we share. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, thinking about how much she has done for us, I think mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah I can definitely see um, how the mentors in your life have influenced how you bring these folks up and help them execute their their professional goals and their dreams of what they want this to be and what they see it to be. So that's, that's really cool too yeah. to get to watch. And, and mentoring by example, mm -hmm. I think, I think that's, that's a good, good thing too. I mean, you, you do a good job on that. So yeah. have to compliment you your life, but it's, she works hard. Yeah, she does. <laughs> it's true. Like I said, if you don't, if you don't know her, you should, cause she's the best in the biz. So 
Thank you again, Kim, for joining us. We're really excited to um, have officially recorded our first podcast episode and have you um, as our as our guest here today. So um, thank you for having a vision of a podcast. Well done. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Yeah, this is a new one for us. But it's that PR folk, you know, the PR folks and communication team coming together, which is awesome. So yeah. Pedro, yeah. So it's it's been really fun. Our first episode, it's it's been great. Thank you, Kim. Again, thanks Erica for organizing JR. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those of you who are listening to us, uh, stay tuned for our podcast. Uh, remember to follow us on social media: Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Facebook. Uh, yeah, and I think if they have questions, suggestions. Yeah, so um, we just want to say thanks for tuning in. Um, if you have any comments or questions or things you'd like to hear about on the podcast, um, we would love to hear from you. So you can just email us at agnext at colostate.edu um, or drop a, we have a comment form on our website as well. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us today for um, ending the Agnext podcast where we're always excited to tell you about what's next from Agnext. Agnext.